This Bill Simmons report is presented by the Capital One Cup, awarding the best in men's and women's college sports. The BS Report is a free-flowing conversation that occasionally touches on mature subjects. First of all, this is the BS Report with Bill Simmons. It might be cool, I don't know. And if it's not, I don't care. The BS Report with Bill Simmons. Bill Simmons works for ESPN. He's also named the sports guy, and he writes a comical sports column. He must be a popular dude. The BS Report. It's got a real dirty sound. Like a rusty steak knife cutting through a well aged steak. Now, now, now. Here's Bill Simmons. Yeah. Welcome to BS Report. 2012 ESPY's host, Rob Riggle. Thanks. In the studio. It's a Friday afternoon. It's I feel beautiful. Bad. I just stepped on your intro, though. I feel bad. You no, I, I, people do that all the time. <laughs> I'm not a real host. Anybody right. can step on my intros. <laughs> Uh, it's a beautiful day outside. It's like 70 degrees, so naturally we both want to be um, indoors. That's right. In and a, this awesome man cave you've created, by the way. You like this. I really do. I told you when I came in, I was like, this is what I envisioned for my secret room. Secret room that you don't have yet. Right. I mean, it'll You're going to have it eventually. 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 Where do you live? What city are you in? Uh, Los Angeles. Oh. Yeah, yeah. I was in New York for 10 years, but I just moved out here a couple years ago. All right. We, we have so much to cover here. I yeah. guess the first thing is... Let's dive in. Respecto Montalban. <laughs> so, how much marijuana was involved with that tie, with that name uh, naming? Was there marijuana around? I'm sure there was. There might I have mean, been. I don't I don't have any documentation of such things. <laughs> um, I was in the Marines the whole time, so I never could do anything like that. Right. But um, you know, how does that come up? So it's a tough world out there. Is it initially you want to honor Ricardo Montalban, or is it you're just throwing out weird combinations of names? We, like, I'm always fascinated by these things. It was. It was. A, we were throwing out weird combinations of names, and we had names that we thought were cool, and names yeah. we thought were funny, and names that we thought were just abstract. And uh, Owen Burke, uh, who is a great producer here in Hollywood, he works over at Gary Sanchez with Will Ferrell right. and Adam McKay. Um, he, we were all sitting around, I think it was at McManus Bar uh, on 7th Avenue and 19th Street there in New York. And he uh, he just said, Ricardo Montalban. And we were like, yeah. And he goes, Respecto Montalban. And we were like, done. It was like, because the other one on the table, I think at the time, was like 21 or, you know, like something. Oh, it sounded like a club. Yeah, but it was like super douchey. And yeah. weird. But that's how most of those names come out. I was on a team called... Um, Remedial Zen at one point. Oh. Then I was on Cowbot. Uh, you get on different teams that have different names, so you never know. For for anybody who's super confused right now, these are improv groups. Yes, yeah, sorry. Yes, names. at the UCB yeah. Theater, there are improv teams. Improv teams. And each team uh, is made up of uh, about eight players, and uh, you come up, you have to come up with a name for your team. It's like a basketball team. Almost. A little bit. A little bit. You have your rotation. You have yeah. your two stars that yeah. need to share the ball, like LeBron and Wade. You have your role players, you have your young up and comers, you That's have your right. old crafty vets. Yeah. It's like that. But you never want say And uh, you always have your eye towards the recruits. Always looking at, yeah. for that young talent. Young blood always helps. Yeah. Gives you a little surge of uh, And it is blood, something. sweat, and tears. Yeah. No different. A lot of blood Well I always felt like at the S N L cast, I've said this before on the podcast, but you probably haven't heard. Um anytime <laughs> in basketball, if you're playing twelve guys, yeah. it's dangerous. Nobody's getting enough minutes, they're not happy. Right. SNL works the same way. Oh, my God. If yeah. there's 12 people trying to get on yeah. the show, it's disaster, and then nobody ends up oh, getting well, that, reps. That was my story. The year I was on the show, I was the only guy hired. I was the only, only new guy. I was the only new guy hired. Yeah. One out of a cast of 14. Right. 14. That's too only many. new guy. And it was and, kind of a bridge And I asked Will right? Ferrell about it. I was like, you know, he came and hosted. And I was like, hey, you got any advice for a, for a new guy? And <laughs> he kind of yeah. looked at me and was like, oh, you might be a little screwed. Yeah. And I was like, that's not what I want to hear. What do you, What? And he's like, well, he goes, when I came on the show, there was like five or six of us in my freshman class. He's like, they had to use us. We were half the cast, and there was only 12 members back then. Yeah. So we were instantly half the cast. We had to be used every week, you know. He goes, you won out of 14, and you're the new guy, you know. Good luck. get Because, you know, you know, Tina is getting her time. Amy Poehler's getting her time. Horatio's getting his. Uh, Daryl Hammond's Fallon getting his. There, yeah. You know, like, everybody's going to get some time, and... If you're the new guy, you're you're shucking and jiving to make something happen. So, right, yeah, there's some yeah. truth to that. So he came in there, and the, there was a turnover year, which is as he as you just said, those are the best years to come because yeah. there's a lot of shots available. Yeah, 
Absolutely. on the court. Absolutely. But yeah, you you were like right in the middle of two different eras, which yep. is bad. Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, it wasn't. I, I think I got the best deal possible. Why? I got to be on SNL, which was a dream of mine my whole life. Yeah. I got the experience. Um, the year that I was on, I wrote sketches that made it to air. I got a character on air, an original character. I got to do five impersonations. Um, I was on every every show, except mm. for one. I wasn't on the Paul Giamatti show. I was cut after dress. Uh. So there was only one out of 22 shows that I missed. Um, so by anybody's standard, I had a really good year. Elias said you had the best show per whatever. <laughs> next, I was coming up with some weird sabermetric well, stuff. But I, I had, by, by anybody's measure, I had a good year, you yeah. know. Um, and uh, I got out. So I got I got the credit and I got out before I got damaged. <laughs> Interesting. So because you know? usually people are on like two, three years and then they kind of graduate up and they become a they little move bit to the top. A little bit. It can happen either way. I've seen yeah. guys been on that show for seven years. You never hear from them again. Yeah. Ever. Now, the one show that you didn't get on, I'm always fascinated by this. Then you have to go to the closing credits when the host comes out. It's like, hi, I've had a great time this year. I'd like to thank the musical band and blah, blah, blah. And then all the cast members are behind them. And if you haven't been on the show, that's got to be humiliating. Now, say that again. So they say goodbye, the closing credits. You're talking about SNL now. Because you said it was just one show I hadn't been on? You said you weren't on one of the 22 episodes. Oh, right, right, right. I still get to come out after the show. And you're right. That is a bad moment. And you're kind when of they're like, like was you're shaking the hands. Like, why are you shaking hands? You well, you're shaking up. hands because you were there all week and right. you did sketches that were in dress rehearsal that were cut after dress rehearsal. All right. So you spent the week hanging out with these people, meeting them, working with them. Just because it got cut after dress, hey, what are you going to do? I always think the handshakes, the the closing credit handshake thing sequence to me is the most fascinating part of the show. Yeah. I like watching it. I like seeing how the, everybody reacts to the host. You can always tell if they're a total dick <laughs> or if everybody <laughs> loved them yeah. or, you know, and how far they stand away from the person sure. and stuff like that. And sometimes they well, just cut like away immediately. School. It is like a high school, too. You know, when you're a freshman, you're a freshman and you kind of yeah. lay back a little bit. When you're more senior, you're out there in the front more. And uh, but if you if the guest host and you had a scene together and you worked a lot and you hung out and you spoke because there's a lot of downtime while you're working scenes or scenes and they're blocking scenes and yeah. you bond with people and you talk to them and there's a lot of people that hosted that I I shook hands with and became friends with and uh, it was good. You tried out with your partner. No, we tried out separately. You can't try out as a. Well, I mean, group. you tried out at the same time. We tried at the same that time. season, and you made it, and he didn't. Was yeah. that how awkward was that? No, it wasn't awkward at all. He was very happy for me. I would just as I would have been Come happy on, for him. It had to be a little awkward. Well, if it was, we never talked about it. Yeah, you know, because we both we always knew what we both wanted. We both wanted to be on that show. Yeah, you know, and we both had legitimate shots at it, and we both gave it our best. So, yeah, and you know, and it had honestly, he's a friend. Yeah. We're talking about Rob Hubel. Yeah. And he's a friend. And had he made it, I wouldn't have, yeah, I would have wanted to make it too. I'm not going to say that. Of course. I mean, we're, you have ambitions in life. But had he made it and I didn't, I would be happy for him because he's a friend, you know? So. What did you do for your, don't you have to do like one impersonation and one? Yeah. If you're, if you're a stand up, you do, uh, um, your best five to seven minutes of stand up. If you're an improviser, like I was, uh, you don't have a stand up routine. So you, do three original characters and three um, impersonations. Wow. Or any variation thereof, 4-2 to 4, not 5-1, but usually like six you characters. You do six? Generally speaking, yes. So, so do you put your best one first or do you save it last? Like what's the order? A lot of Is strategy. Like baseball? A lot of strategy involved in that, you know? So you, you do, clean up hitter bats fourth? I, I always just went with what was the funniest. You know, I did my, you know, like if I did a, an impersonation, which I don't do impersonations, I just don't. Yeah. Um, I would put some of those in the front and then the characters that I created I thought had funnier monologues mm. and I would do those last and again you don't have much time you have five to seven minutes to do six characters so you're popping in and out of character you know you're like up there whipping through stuff and how many people are trying out is it or can you see all of them is it uh, almost like trying out for a role it's it depends on the year but I, on average they probably go out and get about 20 people mm. that audition and it depends on what they're looking for. They might be looking for a woman that year. They might be looking for a man. They might be you or know, a you woman know, man or a woman man or a lady boy. Yeah. You never know what they're going to look for. So it just depends on what they're in, what they're looking for. And you know, they uh, they they bring them in from Toronto, from Chicago, from New York, from Las Vegas, from L.A. And they they fly you all in. And when you get there, it sounds like you want to know about the the audition process. No, I was just curious about like. 
Well, they well, they bring twenty you, people in. You okay. said you were, you know, you this is one of your big goals. So here's this big day. Yeah. And now you have all these people you're sizing up. Obviously, you have to beat. That's some competition. Of these yeah. That's total competition. They had one slot that they were looking to hire for. Yeah. There's twenty of us from around the country. And you probably knew and some there's of them, S- right? there's SNL writers who are on there trying to audition. I mean, the year oh. I got on, Sudeikis auditioned. And so did, like, Rich Tellerico and some of these other writers that were on the show writing. Yeah. That you talk about, it, uh, you know, knowing what they like and what they don't like and what works, you know, they, you know, that it's tough competition, you know. You got to you gotta have your head on. And, f- and they have a little feel for Lauren and the thinking, I would guess. Well, they had, you know, when you go out there and do it, it's uh, it's a two-day process, too. Yeah. You know, the first day you go to a stand-up club and you do your, the best you can. Yeah. And they have all 20 people. Then that night you get a call saying whether or not you made it to the next level. Huh. Then the next day you go to 30 Rock and you actually go up to the studio, 8H, where you actually go out on the stage where the host comes out at the beginning of the show and you do it all over. But that time they've gone from 20 down to 7 or 5. Huh. So it's if you make it to the next day, okay, you're on to phase 2. Then you come out and you do your best. They put you on camera so the people in Burbank can watch. Lauren, Tina, all the you know, head writers and producers, Shoemaker and Higgins sit out there. And they saw you the night before, so they're not going to laugh because they know your material. Right. And then you come out and you do it again. Um, and this time they even tell you to cut it down a little bit. So you got to make decisions on what you're cutting, what you're keeping. Uh, then you go out and do it again. And then you wait a couple weeks. And then you find out if you got on or not. What happened? How did you get on The Daily Show? What, what, how was that Same process thing. different? I, I auditioned. I, uh, I, I was out here in L.A. and I, uh, I went in and auditioned and uh, got a call back to, um, to New York to go in studio and audition with John. Mm. And uh, it was down to me and another guy. And uh, I got it. So that was good. That story wasn't as as uh, as rich as the first <laughs> well, one. Well, I, I don't want to. I, I could bore you. I, I mean, it yeah. is rich actually. I could go into it, but well, you probably wanna, a little more. The wanna, SNL thing must have bought you a little credibility or a little something. It, it little did, but it was you know, after I left that show. I, it was about a year before I got. You know, I had a year where I was developing a pilot for NBC, yeah. and then it was a, so I left in uh, 2005 and I got on 2006. So about a year. Uh, before I got on The Daily Show. So how many... And they only were hiring two people for The Daily Show, and they were doing a global search. They hired John Oliver in England, in London, yeah. and they hired me. Uh, and uh, it was a process. I mean, it was a... They, I think you, Roy Albanese, who's the executive producer, uh, we should ask him, but I think they, they had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of auditions for that. And that is the, one of the most... Um, Beloved shows on the internet, the way it's digested and devoured and picked yeah. apart, and I yeah, mean, people really gravitate towards it. They consider it a news source, which is terrifying. Right. So, did you once you started going on? Yeah. Were you conscious of the feedback? Did you care? Did you ignore that stuff? No, I learned. Like, I learned after SNL never to read anything. Oh, really? I don't care. I, I honestly, I don't read a word. But uh, at SNL, you did. Did you I read did. something damaging? Sure. Oh, of course. The SNL geeks. They live in their basement and they're angry and they've been fans for 30 years and they think they know everything about the show and they actually have some scary intel on the show. Like they right. know it's bizarre. But you know, that you get on there and then, but you know, and they say terrible things about you. Oh, you're fat. Oh, you're this. Oh, you're that. Oh, you're not funny. Oh, you know, just anything, anything they can pick you apart on, they pick you apart. And they're so safe behind their keyboards. Yeah. You know, it's just pathetic. Um, but Will Ferrell, <laughs> Same thing, you know. I mean, they went after him for the first couple of years. Yeah. You know, it takes time on that show to get your legs, to find your voice, to resonate with the audience. So unless you have that time, it's never going to happen. Bill Hader t- was on this podcast a few months ago, and he told the story guy, about. Great guy, by the way. Great yeah, guy. he told the story about uh, somebody who had ripped him to shreds in some internet thing. Yeah. And then he had a driver. A, cu- a few months later, or something it turned out. He pieced it together, and the guy who was driving him. Was, was the, the guy who wrote was yeah. the guy who wrote the thing? Yeah. and he it's was amazing. By it. You have you you say hi to somebody at a coffee shop, and they'll go tweet or write about it. Yeah, and so unless you're sticky sweet, they're like, "Whoa, this guy's a douche." Yeah, what a jerk. Yeah, what a jerk. No, I'm just buying my coffee. Yeah, you know, sorry I didn't massage your feet. Well, you, well, you were kind of there in the Daily Show. That that was uh, it. Kind of went up a level because of that 08 election, and it just seemed like. It was already really popular, but it seemed like it really blew up. Yeah, I mean, the, the show definitely got a lot of, of traction. It yeah. definitely got a lot of traction. Um, 
not because of me, but right. during the time frame I was there. You were there. It, yeah, yeah, I was there when it was when it seemed to really be that 2006 to 2009 time frame seemed to. Because you made me think of there was a feature written about John Stewart probably nine months ago. I think it was Esquire or GQ or something. Kind of nobody had written a John Stewart takedown. Oh, really? Because John Stewart is like 100% approval rating. Everyone's just, oh, that guy's smart. <laughs> that guy's funny. Like nobody. Well, yeah. I mean, there's there are people out there who don't. Well, you there's yeah, yeah those people, but. Um, Somebody tried to do the takedown feature, and it was really interesting. It was almost like, wow. Well, but that's America. Yeah. That's Oof. that's America. If you, you know, people want to celebrate and lift you up and build your success, and then if you get to a place that they're not comfortable with, they're going to take you down a peg. That's yeah. just the way we, that's the way America rolls. We're going to have to bleep this, but I call it the, who the f*** is this guy? You don't, never want to get to that point where people are like, who the f- is this guy yeah, exactly there's then, a lot of that and then that that kind of turns out yeah so so uh, yeah so i never read anything now after good, i read that smart. that one time on snl i made the mistake of checking a blog or something i looked at and i was i it hurt and i was yeah. like that sucks i didn't do anything wrong what yeah. did they f these people yeah. so then i was like all right here's what i'm just not going to do it anymore so i've never read anything and i and i won't because it's ignorance is bliss and I'm a blissful guy. <laughs> but like you're in 21 Jump Street and you got really good reviews. Never know. I don't care. To know. You don't have that one person be like, come on, tell me, did I get good reviews? No. I don't want to know. Any, I, swear, I, I swear I don't want to know. Because I, I'm i sure if there were nice ones, that's great. And I'm happy, but I'm sure there were bad ones too. And I'm I'm just happy going through life <laughs> in my ignorant bliss. So you, you always get asked about your military background. Sure. I'm sure you've always had a sense of humor. Yeah. Um Absolutely. There's a lot of dead time in the military. I'm sure yeah. that was a good thing for, yeah, know, for, for entertaining my peers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I, I never was a, a jackass in front of my Marines, though. Right. Because, you know, I was an officer. Yeah. I never wanted to. There had to be a certain <laughs> order and discipline. Right. Uh, you never wanted to present yourself as a, as a, as a jerk off because they would, you never, I never wanted them to think that I didn't value their lives or what we were doing. Uh, so I had to, I had a one hat I would wear in front of the Marines, and when I was back in my tent or back in barracks uh, around my colleagues or peers or fellow officers, then I would maybe relax a little bit. Maybe do a couple characters. Maybe a little bit. Maybe a little bit. <laughs> maybe some impersonations of some commanding officers that needed to be done. Take the piss out of some of these guys. Yeah. How you're a sports fan? How do you follow sports when you're abroad like that, or do you just you checked out? You kind of check out a little bit, but yeah. um, I bet you're not in a fantasy league when you're in Afghanistan. No, no, yeah, no. Um, although I imagine now they have such connectivity now that I bet they probably can do that. that when I was there, scary, right? I get emails from. Yeah. I'm always amazed when I get emails from there. Hey, I'm when, I was, Kabul, when I was in column. Afghanistan, it was very Spartan. It was yeah. 2001. I mean, it was two months after 9/11. I was there. Uh, in the northern part of Afghanistan, and it was Spartan. Like we really didn't have much connectivity. We did. Yeah. I mean, we had running power from Uzbekistan that would shut off for certain hours during the day, and you never knew it was going to shut off. And so uh, it was more Spartan. But now I think they have more infrastructure over there. So I think maybe they probably could do fantasy football over there. So how did you end up there two months after 9/11? I mean, uh, yeah, I'm sure you're already in the military. Like, did well, I was in the reserves. I was okay. in the reserves at that uh, on 9/11. I was in the reserves, but I was in a reserve unit in Manhattan. New York. So the night of September 11th, I was actually activated because my reserve unit was the only reserve unit in Manhattan. Uh, and when ah. they closed the bridges and tunnels, I got a call from my commanding officer saying we've been activated. This is on September 11th. Yeah. Uh, we've been activated. Uh, report to ground zero tomorrow morning, 8 a.m. So I was like, got it. So I worked on ground zero, uh, moving rubble by hand in the bucket brigades from the 12th to the 18th of Oof. September, 12 on, 12 off, 12 on, 12 off. Until the 18th, and then they, I think they declared it wasn't a search and rescue anymore, it was search and recovery. That being the case, they could bring in the heavy machinery to start moving stuff, because it was like six stories of rubble. Um, but for you know, the first six days, we thought there might be survivors, and you didn't want to bring right. in heavy equipment and all that stuff. So, uh, and then I went from there to one police plaza, and I helped coordinate military and civilian efforts on the recovery process. Um, so that took me through September 30th, then my orders were up, so we were done. But I had a pretty high security clearance for my job, uh, which was unusual for my job. So I figured they're going to need people. So I volunteered to go back on active duty, and I got orders on November 10th, which is the Marine Corps birthday. November 17th, I reported to Central Command down in Tampa, Florida. 
And on November 30th, I was on a plane to Afghanistan. And we, you were already doing a lot of the comedy stuff. Oh, I was deep into comedy. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I was at the UCB. I was actually teaching classes at the UCB. Oh, my God. And, uh, but I was also in the reserves, and I was a captain. And um, So I got called back for a year, went back, did my year, got back towards the beginning of 2003. Um, and then uh, 2004, I got on Saturday Night Live. How did you make the decision to go Marine? So I'm always interested in this answer. Um, uh, they have the highest standards. Interesting. If yeah, you had to do it over again, would you have made the same choice? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because I've heard, anytime I ask this, it seems like Air Force, the Air Force is Air an Force, intriguing they, choice. They, trust me, if I had kids, I'd tell them to go to the Air Force. Yes, yeah, because you get to be in the same place for a big chunk, right? Well, like yeah. six, eight months at a time. Air Force, uh, they, they're, they're awesome. They're really awesome, and they recruit highly intelligent people. Yeah, and they're they're a pretty sharp outfit. The Air Force is all right, um, and they live well. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they live a lot better than Marines. And we have to we're expeditionary. We have to get used to living in the mud and tents and kind of Spartan existence, you know, because we never go anywhere and stay very long. We just kick in the door. Marine um, seems like the has the highest badass potential. I think so. Like if you want, it has the highest ceiling <laughs> to really kick yeah. ass. But the Air Force, they're they're awesome. I think too. They they do all right. I you know, uh, there's the old joke that Air Force they always go wherever they go build a base. They usually they build the golf course first. Then they go back to Congress and they ask for money for the runways, right. you know, and that's generally, I think, the case. But they're they're awesome. I'm not I'm not taking too many digs on the Air Force. So when we uh, when we killed Bin Laden, yeah, you did you find yourself riveted by that story and the details and how they did it and all that stuff, or at this point you don't care? Oh no, I care. I no, care. I mean like about the, the the details, the nitty gritty. Oh stuff. yeah, well. Um, yeah, there's you know there's certain things that uh, you're always interested. I mean, you you always want to know how uh, something like that unfolded or went down, and yeah. uh, it's always going to be intriguing. Um, so yeah, I was definitely interested in it. How far away could you, how like what's the high what's the Navy SEAL equivalent for Marines? What's the highest you could go? Uh, you mean like special forces? Yeah, what's special the, operations, special ops, special ops. Uh, we have what's called uh, the Marine Force Recon. Uh, which is uh, every every branch of service has their own special high speed you right. know hoo type guys. So how far away were you from that? Oh, I was far away from that. How I'm not I'm not away. a I'm not a jungle snake eater you know <laughs> type guy. You know these guys were out there. Those Force Recon guys are badass, and uh, yeah. so are the SEALs. So are the PJs for the Air Force. So are the uh, uh, you know Army Rangers and the Army uh, Special Op guys and their Delta Force and you know. Uh, but we have you know. Marines, Marines, Marines are badass in general, and uh, we have our force recon bubbles. So people don't want to heckle you during one of your improv nights. <laughs> it's probably a bad idea. Uh, yeah, it is. <laughs> Only just, not because of anything physical. God no, just because I, uh, uh, my mouth will yeah lay waste to them. You are not going to get heckled at the ESPYs. <laughs> the first six rows are basically just ESPN executives who are half asleep. <laughs> That's going to be the most well, congenial honest, audience I'm a little you nervous. You know, these, these, the, you know, I've seen these crowds in the past. They're, they seem a little tight. They seem a little tight. They don't yeah. give up much. They just sit there and they got this look on their face of annoyance. And it's like, guys, it's a night of celebration. Let's have some fun. And yeah. you, they're like, ugh. You're like, well, I'm sorry if the one night a year people, <laughs> you know, you're all together, and we're yeah. celebrating you. Isn't good enough for you. I think they're with you until the first until the first joke doesn't work, and then after that, it <laughs> moves into that mode of all right. Is this going to be a long night or not? So well, no pressure. That'll be that. early. So, yeah, you know, you get that out of the way. That'll be. I'm going to knock that out early. I'm just going to take a big dump. <laughs> first word out of my mouth. It's going to be in. The, yeah. No, it's going to be I, fun. We're going to have fun. It's a fun show. It's not a celebration. I'm excited about it. I'm going to have fun. So. Come on board, you know. Get on board or don't. I don't care. What's your favorite sport? Football. Football. Yeah. Usually and we college football basketball. players. College basketball, too. Because of Kansas? Definitely. And that's why you're friends with Sudeikis. Absolutely. Well, and we also grew up in the same hometown, and we worked on SNL together. And there's a lot of reasons I'm friends with Sudeikis. So. We do a charity event together. We co-host a charity event together. Paul Rudd, Kansas City. Paul Rudd, Kansas City. We went to KU together. John Hamm, St. Louis. Yeah. Who else is in? There's like this weird St. Louis, Kansas City, like. Well, there's a Missouri, Kansas City. Missouri, Dave Keckner, like, Dave Keckner, the wonderful Dave Keckner uh, from uh, Mid Missouri, married a Kansas City girl. Um, yeah, uh, Eric Stone Street, uh, Kansas City guy. So that's six now. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of talent coming out of there. 
because everybody talks about Canada, but maybe nobody people should talk more about the. They should look on the uh, hmm. on the old Missouri River there. So Kansas basketball. Kansas basketball. I'm a Jayhawk. I graduated from KU uh, with a theater and film major. Where'd you watch the Chalmers game? New York. I was in New York. Uh, I was working on a field piece for The Daily Show, and uh, we went late. And I was like, guys, you don't get it. It's the championship. I got to go. They finally let me go, and I I raced home, and I watched it uh, at my apartment. So I didn't get to watch it with a bunch of people. Don't taunt Derek Rose about it. If he's, if he's at the, I don't know if he's at the Espers or not. If he's at a rough year. Yeah. Well, you don't have to bring up the game. To well, him. I, would, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do Point that. at him. <laughs> Talk about just, the KU. Just held up a sign in 2008. What, what celebrities do we have in store for this? I have not done any. Um, oh, God. I've not done the vetting. I mean, usually the, most of the football players come. We got a lot. Of, we most got of the a, NBA players come. We do. We have some. We have some great athletes that are going to be there. A lot of football players, a lot of uh, basketball players. Um, uh, we've got a lot of celebrities. Uh, some very beautiful celebrities oh. going to be there. You might want to. I could probably check guess who a couple of them are. Uh, go for it. I'll I'll give you a wink. I right guess now. Kate Upton is going to be here. Mm. See, I don't know what I can tell you. What I can't tell. All right, you, man. Don't you don't tell me. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to give away too much. All yeah. I can say is tune in if you want to have some tune fun and, and see some magic. And you've taped all your stuff? Uh, the pre-tapes, yes. Pre-tapes. Well, not all of it. We've still got a couple more to do. All right. I know. We're getting down to the wire. This How are you feeling about those? Is, oh, we're having a blast. I feel good about them. How much has ESPN tried to censor you and ruin your life over these last few weeks? Well, they haven't tried to ruin my life, but you know, it's it's you can't just go in there and do what you want to do. That's for sure. you got to... It's a big team process, and there's considerations to be made. And mm. but I will say I that, this, that is a, dance goes. this is but they're a great group of guys and gals, and uh, we have a great executive producer, Mora, uh, Who? Mant, Mora Mant. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Uh, John Walsh, who you're going to be talking to in a little bit. Yeah, uh, we got so they're great. Heard of him. They're great people that are very flexible, and they're 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 trying to you know let us get away with as much as we can. But it's still a family show. So family show. Family show. Got to play it. Got to play it's it. Nine to o'clock, a, right? A certain way. Nine o'clock. Nine o'clock East Coast nine o'clock time. Wednesday. Yeah. Twentieth Espies. Twentieth Espies, July eleventh, nine o'clock Eastern. Uh, don't miss out. They didn't do Roman numerals for this though, which I was very curious about. They should have two X's because you can do cool things with like stamping two X's and two, the T-shirts would have been cool too. I think with the I two totally X's. I totally agree. I don't get it's it. It's only like the Olympics, Super Bowl, and yeah. WrestleMania have yeah. been the only ones who really captured the Roman numerals right. for the most part. Especially when you got cool Roman numerals like that. Yeah, the twenty. I think they made a mistake. Yeah, really I'm no marketing for... genius, but I think that's pretty self-explanatory, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? We think we'll get Steve Nash at this thing. New LA, hello, person, yeah, LA personality. Yeah, what about uh, maybe maybe even get Dwight Howard in there too? All come right, on, so come right on. now it's Friday. It's what time is it? Uh, it's ten after one on yep. Friday afternoon. Yep. I think Dwight Howard is going to be a Laker. I have no inside information yep. on this. It I think, just, I think it's, it's always made the most sense. I think Bynum's out. Bynum's out. Meta, and they bring in Dwight. And what do you think? and what do you another think? contract. I think they have to take another contract. Yeah, the Turkish but, guy. You think he did Turkoglu? I think that he <laughs> he gets thrown in. He's he's a part of the deal. Okay. But yeah, I think I think that happens. Yeah. It's very too. logical. I think so it's too. It's always been the most logical spot for him. And okay. For now if that reason, happens, I'm scared. Do they beat Oklahoma City? I'm very. Do scared they win of the West? Team. Well, now at that point, you have to hope Father Time gets involved. As Charles Barkley says. You're not talking. Yeah. What are you talking about? Thirty is Nash 37, 38. Nash turns 39 during the season. So there you go. So yeah, this is this is it's a I think it's um. Now, like this would ha- it would have to pop next year. Kobe's <laughs> Kobe's going to be I think thirty four, but yeah. he's he's had this is uh, he came in the league in ninety six, and he has all those NBA miles on his knees, which yeah. is why he keeps going to Germany to to do things to make them feel better. At some point, he's going to break down. Yeah. Um, Gasol, who knows emotionally how he'll handle this? <laughs> he's got new teammates. Right, I don't a, know. Yeah, there's somebody. Somebody else is peeing on his tree now. A yeah, bit. we don't know. Yeah. I mean, who knows with him? Yeah. Uh, so I don't know. I mean, all the things I'm grasping onto as a Celtic fan are uh, are not real <laughs> things. I'm nervous. <laughs> the Dwight Howard thing. I think if Bynum stays, it's fine. Yeah. I'm not worried because I think Bynum will get clumsy and then Nash and. He'll, he'll be worried about getting Kobe shots, and it's just, I think it'll be too complicated. But if Howard's in there, it all kind of falls into place. That's which, what scares which me. Which I think is what they're gunning for, and I think that's what we're going to see. Yeah. Houston is trying to throw the kitchen sink for the Howard trade, I know. 
Oh, really? Yeah. And they're also hooking and jabbing for Lynn, but the Knicks aren't going to let Lynn. Yeah, that was stupid. The Knicks, they don't care about money. (laughs) The Knicks throw money around. They don't care. Yeah. But they're not going to let him go. They're not going to let him go. Yeah. Of course they're not going to let him go. But they're bringing in Kid, which which raises a flag to me, though. Because it makes me think, Why? why would they... Why would they carry both of those? Because the Knicks always like to have one really washed up guy in the team. You know <laughs> realize? Every year they have a washed up guy. They have a spot for That's him in the salary. That's an interesting angle. I think they wanted him for uh, veteran leadership. Um, he can shoot threes. He could be their backup point guard, but play a little two guard. Okay. And uh, I don't know. It's always it's the thing with, that's funny about Kid to me is like he wants to play twenty years. Yeah. That's like they always say that. And then, well, I'm sure he does. It doesn't mean it's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> 20 years seems like a lot, uh, but that'll be interesting too. Yeah. If they get Lynn back, I, I actually think they're going to be dumb enough to match the Landry Fields Toronto offer of 20 million bucks, because then again they don't care about money; they just rake money in. 20 million dollars. What do you have for three years? Have, and what did Lynn? He's have? like an 11th man, Landry Le- Fields. But Lynn, what did he have last year? 30 starts. Yeah, it was like 26. 26 starts for 20 million. Well, here's the thing. Well, no, I Lynn was co- more. I love this country. I Lynn love- was 24. <laughs> Lynn was 24. But I think uh, the thing with Lynn is you get all the overseas money. Oh, you can market bank. it. Bank. Yeah. I mean, come on. That's what, yeah. There's always, a, there's always a rhyme behind the reason there, and that's what it is. There's always a joke when Yao Ming wanted to retire. Houston was like, no, no, don't retire for one more year. <laughs> Just put wear a suit. We'll pay you $15 million bucks. Because they would have, like, tripled it going back because with all the, uh, the Far East money. Yeah. But I don't know. It'll be interesting. It seems like the merry-go-round is is gonna stop soon, though, because most of the guys have. Yeah, signed. things have got to shake out here soon. Yeah. So, but it's been Dwight it's Howard. been entertaining. You can't deny that. My worst fear for the ESPYS is Dwight Howard, Kobe, Nash, and Gasol all standing on stage with you, all with their hands <laughs> up like this. <laughs> I like it. I might charge the stage with like a pickaxe or something. <laughs> um, all right. Good luck. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. I love your man cave. Thank you. If you ever want any recommendations on wood paneling. No, yeah, well, I would, yes. I will will come to you and get it because that is quality wood paneling. Do you sit in here and watch games on the weekends and stuff? No. That would be kind of weird because I have a family and a a house. (laughs) We are. We're going to watch something. I'm sure that family interrupts your game watching. What are we talking about? No, they're locked out. (laughs) They they have certain times they can't come in. Uh, Wednesday night, 9 o'clock. John Walsh is going to come on now for a little oh, bit. Oh, perfect. Yeah, yeah. July 11th. Check out the ESPYs. It's going to be a lot of fun. And 21 Jump Street on demand, <laughs> which was excellent. <laughs> Thank you. I really liked it. Good. good. I told you that it was where we're walking in. I wasn't, yeah. wasn't like a smoke blow. Yeah, yeah. No, um, I appreciate no, it. No, it was good. I, I've rented so many bad movies. <laughs> right. On, because, you know, once you have like two kids, you're basically trapped to on demand after 9 o'clock on yep. a Friday night unless you have a babysitter. And yeah. it's, it was so nice to rent a movie and just kind of laugh and not be mad about it the entire time. Good, which, I'm, which I'm so often happens. It. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm falling into the same trap as well. A couple I unexpected twists and surprises too. I don't want to spoil, but there was yeah. one. I was like, "Whoa, how did that happen?" Yeah, I won't say, but if anyone who's seen the movie, they know. Yeah, there was one. one it really t- slips past you until it actually unfolds. Yeah, I was like, yeah. "Oh my God, what's happening?" Yeah, it's kind of cool. Yeah, it was pretty good. Yeah. Anyway, I won't spoil, it, but good luck on Wednesday. All right, man. Thanks. Thank Bill. you. All right, bringing in the executive editor of ESPN, my boss, John A. Walsh. The twentieth Espies. You've been here for all twenty. Actually nineteen, but that's okay. What do you mean? There was one year where uh, we tried the trial show. Should uh, Pete Rose be in the Hall of Fame? Taped at Harvard, and it was conflicting with the Espies, so I didn't do the Espies that year. Oh, but there has been twenty Espies. There have been twenty Espies. Took some heat over the years. Now it's kind of is what it is. Yeah, it went through an evolution. Um, I remember making fun of it in a couple columns on our old well, website. Well, that's why we hired you because you knew how to make fun of it. <laughs> uh, the, uh, but it's it's taken on a form, and it, you know, from Dennis Miller, who was irreverent and funny, and had you know, I still think the first show was um, one of the five or six, seven best of all of the twenty, hmm. um, because of uh, De Bears and Jim Valvano, and Dennis had a great night. Yeah, and he dressed in the golf the woman Dottie Mockery's dress for a presentation. There were a lot of great things about that first show, but 
what we did, we, we learned over the years, we tried to kind of have it both ways and make jokes and make fun, and sometimes they gave, became cruel, and it wasn't really right. And once we determined, it must have been seven, eight, nine years ago, that it's a celebration of sports, we pretty much stick to that script. And when Rob was talking about, well, what happens when new people come on, whether they're writers or hosts, we just say, you know, certain things are out. We're not making fun of the sport of soccer. You know, the mm. writers every year would come in and make a fun because soccer really isn't a sport. Well, they've been proven wrong, but we did, we every year it's amazing to me. I just say one thing, guys, we can't make fun of sports because there's athletes from those sports who are in the audience and they come here to celebrate. That's one of the lessons that we learned. Well, also, that's, it's not even an accurate humor joke anymore. Well, that's what I mean. They, Soccer's the, gained the, steam. <laughs> the boys have been proven wrong. Yeah. <laughs> there might be other sports to make fun of, but I don't know if I'd go after soccer. Not, Although I will say, though, the Euros, for the potential that it had, the last few games weren't good. You know, just, it well, is what it is. But it was poised to be a much bigger event than it, I think it ended up being. Well, I think that the, the countries that made it into the finals really helped the U.S. audience in yeah. terms of immigration. Totally. That was that was That was a big, big plus for... for uh, television uh, but the games themselves weren't what we'd hoped they would be yeah well that's luck of the draw sometimes yeah um you know we're talking about live events and just what the espn we is has swallowed up so many live events to things and i think it's really interesting that the ratings for live events have either kind of stayed straight or gone up over the last couple of years whereas like if you look at traditional tv and dramas and comedies and things like that all that stuff's trending downwards because the, it's so splintered now with internet and with um, on demand and every, there's so many channels now. And yet live events seem like they're almost immune to this. Do you feel like the live events are actually in a better place than they've ever been? Oh, absolutely. Because I think of the internet and talk radio and spoiler alerts. Things have been given away. Um, the, you can do a lot of things on demand. If you really want to see and experience the drama of a li- of of a sporting event you got to watch it live totally i totally agree it's and you can try to tape it and pretend you're not going to find out the score but it's pretty hard and it's near impossible actually well it's impossible now i i even in the old days i mean going back 20 30 years while watching tv or being in tv i was shocked that people would even think that taping a tape delayed event was worth something yeah. i remember in the original days of espn when college football was taped on saturday afternoon and they could start showing it at midnight on saturday night and that was from 1979 to 1985 yeah it was only in 1986 when espn finally was allowed to do live games and i i would never watch those college football even though i'm a big college football fan i never wanted to watch a tape delayed game on saturday night at midnight or sunday at 10 a.m i'm old enough to remember the the greatest sporting event of all time the the uss usa 4 ussr 3 1980 olympics that was tape delayed yes it was and i remember uh being uh at the cowboy bar in new york with pete axthelm whose uh friend was writing it and running to the phone and calling up and getting the score as we were as as before the tape delay went on right i we were in the supermarket and heard the score after two periods and it was either i think it was tied after two periods i don't remember but just knowing that we were in the game and then going home and just kind of waiting for the tape delay game to start. But those days are long gone. And the reason I brought that up was the ESPYs are, are now live, which is something well, that in this day and age kind of feels like it had to happen. Well, the ESPYs were live. The I know. The and then it began tape delayed. For, uh, the first year was live an hour tape delay because we were afraid. <laughs> what would happen because we'd never Probably done it. should have been. Yeah. But yes, and it proved to be correct. And then the next, uh, oh, it must have been probably 10, 12 years. I think we were um, live to tape, uh, taped on Wednesday, live on Sunday, maybe four years, five years. Right. So about, about 75% of them uh, have been live. Not last year was the first one that had been live in a while, or two years ago? Two years, yeah, two yeah. years ago. Yeah. So the ESPYs, when you look at it, it's it it brings a lot of things to the table that could potentially be bad for ESPN. One, um, the ability to make fun of ourselves, which we've struggled with over the years. Which but still, great. one of the and I will defend the show in this respect is when we really had to make fun the decision. It was one of the most brilliant pieces that the ESPYs have ever done with Steve Carell and uh, Paul Rudd. That so was just great. So in a way, it's probably good because you there's no way you can do the ESPYs without making fun of ESPN a little bit, which we I feel like we've been able to do. Yeah, I'm well, going to use we since I work for the company. 
And you can make fun of ESPN. Yeah, and I like making fun of ESPN, <laughs> but it always comes from a good place. Um, and then you also have a bunch of athletes that are there. Well, that we are the host of all these different parties. Like that could potentially go in a bunch of bad directions. And I don't ever remember that really coming back to haunt ESPN. Well, not has only has it? it not haunted us, but in those first years, I remember, you know, the first ESPY, I think the one one athlete that was going to present, uh, Randall Cunningham, or was it uh, Mike Singletary? One of the two was caught in a plane over Albany in an ice storm and didn't show up. Hmm. So Chris Berman had to play the part of Mike Singletary. Uh, but we, we, maybe there were three or four athletes that weren't in the show the first year. And I believe in these last couple of years, we're somewhere between 140 and 200 athletes come to Los Angeles to the show. Hmm. So it's a real show of the athletic community, and we try and give them uh, a nice experience so they feel, you know, good about uh, what we're what what the show is and what what the roles they can play in it. What's your single favorite SB story? Um, I guess the first the first year, uh, the first show, um, I I had never done an award show. Uh, I had written proposals for award shows. In fact, a show similar to the ESPYs, which I'd given to ESPN when I was hired in uh, 1987. Um, but the first year we were doing a show, and my boss was Jim Allegro, a beautiful man, a wonderful guy, and he hadn't done it. Oh, we have to sell tickets? Oh, really? Oh, that's part of yeah. That's part of what you do in the show. You have to get tickets. You have to print them. You have to sell them. You have to have invitations. You have to do a lot of these things. And we had a, a wonderful producer, Ed Griles, um, who had done uh, un, uh, universe pageant, Miss Universe pageant shows. Uh, so he knew the award show March. Um, and so we were working real hard on the show. And uh, the, pre, uh, the president uh, of the company, uh, our boss, Steve Bornstein, comes over to Jim Allegro and me in the afternoon at, uh, at the Paramount Theater at the garden and we say yeah well, you know we th we think we got the show under three hours and steve looks at us and says and this is at three in the afternoon he says if you don't get this show down to two hours you guys could be fired by tomorrow <laughs> oh <laughs> no jim and i are looking at each other so we go we're cutting down the show we're cutting down the show and uh and the uh, robert smigel and we're we're we're, we're collapsing things and robert smigel and De, De bears are on the set and they had a great bit about the sb pool yeah, and every every category, every every winner that they projected was Ditka, except for a female athlete, they chose Mrs. Ditka, <laughs> <laughs> and it's a really great jokes. But they they weren't getting on the show, so Smigel walks up at one point, and a beautiful man, Robert, and he says, "John, why should I be here? We're, we're going to go home." So I said, "Ed, you got to get these guys in the show." Right. So we get them in the show, so it's a little bit longer. And then it comes time for the V Award, and it's Jim Valvano's the most emotional moment in the history of the that show. That was the first one. First one. Oh, I didn't yeah. know that. Or yeah. I knew that and forgot it. Uh, anyway, it was uh, that was that was the moment, and uh, we had him down for a three-minute speech, and he walked up there, and we uh, uh, the the uh, one of the producers I forget who it was started to flash the red light, and Jim, uh, in legendary fashion, points to the red light. He says, "I'm about ready to die. Do you think I care about that red light?" Yeah. And so the show then went. The show uh, his his speech went 17 minutes. And we had it scheduled for three. So then the rest of the night was short horror about going back and forth and uh, cutting sections and putting uh, two presentations together and changing presenter combinations. We didn't know what the hell we were doing. Yeah. But we got it done. And then the show was over. And one of the executives from the committee comes up and he says, John, you have an hour to cut the show down for a re-air at 2 o'clock in the morning. And so I, it was so bad that I was, I was shaking. I was coming back, and I figured, well, boy, I can have a, I can have a beer. It was so late. I went up. The bar was closed for the after party. Uh. <laughs> but it was a, it was a, um, an interesting night, and I'll never forget that night. And that's why the after parties now last until eight in the morning the next morning yeah. because of that one experience here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm old enough not to be able to, to make it past midnight. So, do you think that that Jimmy V moment? The fact that that happened in the first show, that must have just helped it because that became the iconic moment. Well, we didn't really know, you know, if this was going to work. And we came back up and Steve Bornstein, despite the fact that the show did go, I think, two hours and 38 minutes, uh, we came back up and Steve came over to me and shook his hand and he said, thank you. Um, we, have an, we have an annual award show. 
Huh. He, he knew right away, especially because of the... Uh, and give credit to uh, John Lack, who was an executive at ESPN at the time. John was the person who said that we should give an Arthur Ashe Award um, and we should give the first one to Jimmy V. And that was added into the show. For the listeners, Bornstein was the guy running ESPN at the time. No, he was... He was he or actually, running... Uh, what was uh, his job? He, I think he was the head of programming and production yeah, at yeah. the time. Yeah, yeah, he was... Bodenheimer was running everything, but he was the guy who made the... Decisions no. like what that. Happened, We're George was affiliated. What I, I don't. I, I can't, he probably was president. Oh yeah, by you're then. right. He I was president by then. Yes, I got to read the ESPN book again. Yeah. Oh wait, I burned I gotta, it because I got to remember it. I got to remember. Oh wait, it. I burned the ESPN. Yeah, book Steve was the president. I was such a then. jerk in it. Uh, yeah. So that was. Who do you think was the best host then? Uh, I think the the the, the best show. Uh, in terms of everything clicking because of a musical number and everything else was the year that uh, Justin Timberlake did it. But it's really hard. There are there are seven or eight or nine shows that, you know, terrific hosts that did. Like I said, Dennis Miller's first year. Seth was fantastic uh, last two years. Samuel L. did three years. Jamie Foxx, man, that, you know, uh, the Serena tennis ball bit was one of the most memorable uh, moments in the show. Um I, I, we've we've had we've had a, a, a I think a, a fair share of uh, of terrific shows, especially lately now that I think we're we've reached a cruising altitude. And Mora, whom Rob mentioned, is running the show and has an idea of uh, the ins and outs and what what's going to work and what's not going to work. Is it true you're retiring after the Super Bowl? No, I'm, I'm staying on. Mr. Skipper and I have agreed that I'm going to go into uh, 2014. I knew you weren't going to retire. You're so full of crap. <laughs> uh, Got to make sure Grant was a huge success. You try. You you're, you know you're like the Brett Favre of sports media. <laughs> I'm leaving. No, this is it. No, this is gonna be the last year. Now 2014. It was, so we made news here. Yeah, you made news. Your here. buddy Richard Deitch might tweet this <laughs> later. Is he one of your loyal listeners? I don't know. Okay. Who, well, you'll find out now. now cause yeah. Somebody will tweet him now, and then he'll tweet, and then things will get misinterpreted, and something bad will happen. Uh, so 2014. Yes. That, does, is part of this new contract that you, you're moving into my guest room? Be honest. <laughs> well, I'd like to spend more time in, in the warm weather. That's I make no bones. When it can snow. Right, so, well, this but, is, but life is changing. Life is changing. We're going to have a grandchild next month, and so uh, the world is going to be different. For this, me. Uh, this sounds promising. That's very promising. So 2014. Yes. And how many? So how many? How long will your career be at that point? Then will that be? Th- I'll be 69 years old, and I will have worked for 47, 46 years. In 2014 will be, be 27 years at ESPN. Yes. Uh, 25. Uh, no, I'll be 26. 26 years at ESPN. 26 years. Yes. And yeah. how do you how different do you think Sports Center is going to be over this rest of this decade? Because you were you're credited as the person who moved Sports Center into the direction it is now, made it more newsy, all that stuff. And now you have VSPN.com, which is basically a twenty four hour Sports well, Center I, video. I think that's one of the big challenges, Bill, is that um, Sports Center had a, a an embryonic stage or a birthing stage, an embryonic stage where people were trying to find out, my God, you know, the the largest sports cast on a nightly basis. Prior to that, were local newscasts of three minutes and maybe a Sunday night telecast once a week of 30 minutes. And these these people were putting on shows that sometimes were as small as 15 minutes and sometimes as long as uh, an hour and a half or two hours. And then it finally settled on three half-hour shows uh, a day. So I think that that stage went on. And then when we got there, Steve Anderson and I, we made some changes in uh, uh, staffing. We made some changes in... Um, the direction of the show, we uh, we learned about the behaviors of our audience, and we made some changes in the rundown of the show and some of the people on camera, and we went through uh, and we got some reporting. We got a lot of reporters uh, over a period of time, which heretofore didn't really exist. I think they had one freelance reporter, um, full time uh, freelance part-time reporter uh, before uh, we started hiring the uh, and the Andrea Kramers and the Jimmy Robertses and Chris Myers and Mark Schwartz's of the world. Um, so, um, so there was some big changes. Then there's a period in the early 2000s when uh, Mark Shapiro uh, uh, brought on shows like PTI um, to the network and changed some of the elements of SportsCenter to, to reflect opinion. 
And now we're in a period where the technology and social media and Twitter are changing the dynamics of the consumption of sports media. So Sports Center will enter yet what I would call its fourth or fifth period, mm. and we don't know what that's going to be. Sports Center 5.0. That's probably what it is. Yeah, I don't know where it goes because you know what really changed like about a year ago or maybe like 18 months ago? All of a sudden, you could watch highlights of any game on ESPN.com pretty quickly after the game ended. Like, if I missed the Red Sox game, I could go into the Red Sox box score recap thing, and the video was there, and it was just ready to click it, and I could see the highlights. I thought that was a game changer for me personally, because a lot of times I was watching SportsCenter partially because, oh, I, I got to get the Red Sox highlights. Oh, I gotta. Now I don't need SportsCenter for that, and it makes me wonder... The, as live streaming just gets better and better, the iPad, certainly none of us anticipated the whole iPad and the, and the way that was going to change the way people consume things. I do wonder, hey, will sports center have to evolve into more like a first take type show? Well, I think there are a lot of elements. I, the, the biggest thing that, that I believe is true, whether it's 140 characters or it's a 12-minute piece on sports center or uh, outside the lines or wherever, that storytelling is more important than anything else and than it ever has been. And storytelling, whether it's a highlight and an originality, taking the time to do the highlight in a different order and way from the traditional ways we've done it, um, being able to do readers about the strange things that are happening in sports, taking some of the stories and evolving them with the different angles. You also have... Um, you have certain paradigms uh, in the business have changed. The beat reporter is still important. The notes reporter is still important. But now there are beats that are emerging about technology, about analytics, um, uh, about international sports. Uh, women's sports is, is, is gaining momentum. There, there are a lot of things that are going to happen where uh, and, and highlights are endemic to all of the elements of what, what we do. But storytelling is going to be, if you're talking to, like talk to college students, tell them the one thing that you want to learn, whether it's reading novels, whether it's reading biographies or whatever, is how to tell a good story. Because that's going to, that's going to win the day no matter what. So you don't see Sports Center changing into more of a debate show with some highlights where you push stuff on ESPN.com and maybe think, you integrate the website more? I don't know. I don't know. Don't you think there's? Don't you think that, that with talk radio and with uh, uh, somewhat with some podcasts and uh, with the number of shows that ESPN puts on, we have Around the Horn, we have First Take, we have PTI, uh, even the shows... Uh, you could DSPN say two shows. E e e uh, well, PTI isn't around the horn, isn't? Well, no, I'm saying like Levitard and Le Sports Le Nation. Le and Levitard, yeah. uh, uh, even the numbers show and Sports Nation show. There's a, a, a high level of debate. I think that debate will be a part of Sports Center. Um, I'd like to see the idea of debates evolve into something a little bit more meaningful uh, than. Um, just uh, volume over uh, thoroughness and substance. I'd like to see that happen some. Be careful because point. the Pointer Institute is now listening to this podcast. They, their alarm just went off as soon as you hit this topic. There was as, a big as, bat signal came off. And the, and the 15 candidates to be the successors to the uh, Pointer Institute are, are taking note. Listen, I, I've, I've said it before. I'll say it again. The best ombudsman would be me. You'd never let me do it. I'd be the best ombudsman you ever had. Well, I'm, at, I'm I push it into all kinds of crazy directions. <laughs> I'm having uh, <laughs> breakfast tomorrow with one of our former ombudsmen out here in L.A., oh. Mr. Olmeyer. Yeah. Looking no, forward I to that. I would never want that job. That's a thankless job. <laughs> but Well, yeah. for certain people that are built to do it, um, it's it's terrific. If, if you can pour your heart and soul into it. The hard part about it for us is that we have we we spit out so much programming, 40,000 live hours a year of TV, how many millions of words in the internet? Uh, Twenty six magazines, uh, twenty four seven radio station uh, yeah. radio. I mean, it's it's. I, we were reviewing the uh, uh, the. We have a committee and uh, that we do for uh, the selection of who the successor is, and uh, I was going over. Uh, I should have at least been on that committee. Oh well, you're on. You're on. We only had one meeting so far. So Thanks. Consider Can yourself. Can I call in like Charlie and Charlie's <laughs> Angels? <laughs> yeah. Right, yeah. So. Uh, anyway, we, uh, you know, I, I don't think anybody has uh, uh, done a column on ESPN Radio, and, and we must have had eighty some, somewhere close to a hundred columns at this point. 
Hmm. But it's uh, it's been an interesting enterprise. Maybe because of the eight second delay, anything that would have led to a column was excised somehow. <laughs> right? Maybe it's not even possible to do that. Um, you were talking about the the debate thing. Mm-hmm. That's been a constant criticism of ESPN lately. That people are worried that the channel is now turning into just two people yelling at each other. And we've come and gone in waves with that. And now it seems like we're in a wave where debate has become. Well, I think what you've popular. De- what's really developed here is one show has hit a nerve because it's developed a debate personality. Well, it's also hit ratings, and, and it's and that's part of the reason yeah. uh, that it, it, it's hit, it's hit ratings, and uh, and the reason is that these two per- these two personalities have clicked. Uh, Stephen A. and Skip, it, you're Stephen about. A. Smith and uh, Skip Bayless, and yeah. early in the morning, uh, first thing in the morning, and it, so it has a, a natural. Uh, content conceit of first take on things because everybody's out to have a take on something. The, the, the devaluation of news in this day and age uh, is considerate, considerable. So um, it's it's much more um, likely that people are looking to see, well, what does such and such think about this? Yeah. Um, but I, I do think that there are uh, places that debates can go that they haven't gone so far. So it'll be something that we should be looking at. I agree with you. I'm glad we agree on that, John Walsh. Yeah, well, you know, we, we get to agree on one thing every time I come on the podcast. Debates can go in a lot of different directions. I think a good example of, in my opinion, the best way a debate can go is how Wilbon and Kornheiser do it, where they're arguing, but there's a healthy friendship that you feel the entire time. And when Levitard is on with either of them, it's I get the same feeling. Yeah. And even when I go on every once in a while, because I like those guys and... You know, it's there's not an antagonistic vibe to it. Skip and and Steve and A are actually friends with each other. Yes. And I, I even when they're antagonistic, I feel like it's almost like stage actors a little bit. Well, and that's the part I feel like the general public misses. Like they they're doing a lot of this just to do it. Yeah. Well, that's been a, a long tradition in TV. Um, Howard Cosell was quite an actor in his his day with debating the world of sports. Uh, yeah, but with him, you know this better than anyone. Late in his career. He became uh, a real curmudgeon. Yes. And there was just, you know, he was using, if he had people on his show, he would really try to make them look bad for and whatever I, I reason. Think he, I think he had trouble more with the sports and the way the sports were being run than he did with, you know, individuals. And, and, although and did, the jockocracy. He did, he did take after a couple of people. I think Mike, what's interesting with Mike and Tony, um, who have been doing this and, you know, th- their friendship is what you see on the air. They'll talk the same way as to go to the parking lot, yeah. as you know. But and, th- and actually, it's 100% the same way, which is like, it's been the cliched way when people talk about them. Oh, they're like that out there. They really literally are. They're the same exact way. <laughs> Whether they're preparing for the show yeah. or they're going to dinner. But what one of the things that gets lost in there, they will find a nuance when they're actually have agreement on a subject, and the nuance will make it sound like they're debating one another. Right. Or, or they'll pick... Uh, they'll agree on something, but it'll be one of their favorite subjects. So the other boy, the other, uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, either Mike or Tony will get to the other guy and say, your boy. Right, right. And that'll make it sound like there's a disagreement. Little, It's like a little derisive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, they're really good at it. I watched that show really carefully trying to figure out how I would be able to host if I hosted it. And there's so many subtle things that they do that just... It's well, so my, hard to step in on. My God, they've they've done the darn thing for, I, I guess, 25, 26 years, maybe. Yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, just because I, I, I remember them in the Washington Post newsroom, or sports, uh, sports right. uh, department, and they were doing it then. Do you do you find it amusing, frustrating, annoying, or all three of those things? The way that ESPN is is covered so voraciously by. Um, the sports critics and the blogosphere just every single move like even like we had some free agents recently and it was covered like you know like lebron james you know in this little sphere is too much made of that like why do people care so much well uh, i i uh it's it's uh, interesting I'll, I'll give you a, a little bit of history here for, from my perspective anyway i always felt that the media paying attention to the media the meta media stuff didn't appeal to a general audience. Now, whenever I was in charge of something... I agree with you, by the way. When I started Inside Sports, I wanted to get the media's attention 
the uh, uh, select media's attention, so we had a media column because I wanted people in the media to pay attention to us. I didn't care about the fans. That was written for media people, and the, like Ron Powers, um, the, 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 who was the media critic for Inside Sports, who was a Pulitzer Prize winner, and he was on a very high level, so the people in the media had to pay attention to him. Yep. Now, I came to ESPN. Um, there wasn't that much attention paid. But I think what happened with talk radio, where fans got involved with hosts, and now the Internet, and now the blogosphere... I am amazed at the number of uh, the amount of attention that's paid to the media. Uh, we do a monthly chat, a transparency chat uh, on ESPN.com, and a senior executive will go on there and answer questions for an hour. And we will get somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 100,000 to 150,000 people who will uh, pass through the chat, go, yeah. go through the chat. And that's a significant number of people. I mean, I told you when we when we did our first chat and we did we did it on the demise of the American newspapers. I, I walked out of here telling you I don't know who the hell's going to listen to that. And then we, we looked around. I asked Pat uh, Patrick Stigman, who uh, who uh, is uh, the executive day to day fellow at ESPN.com, and said, Patrick, how many people? And it was over 120,000. Yeah. It's crazy. I there is an interest now. And there is an interest behind the scenes in the media. There's an interest of how things are done. There's also a lack of education about the seriousness with which decisions are made, the um, urgency or the immediacy of making decisions. Uh, I, again, I, the, the way the media is developing, um, immediacy and urgency are more important than accuracy and thoroughness. And that's a fight that we constantly have about how we respond to the scrutiny and the criticism to try and be as transparent and try to get as much out there as we can when we know, we, we, when we have researched whatever happened behind the scenes to tell the story um, the way it really unfolded instead of the way people, a lot of people guess about motivation. A lot of people guess about uh, um, what we're trying to accomplish until they're there. Uh, and we have a, a significant number of people with journalistic bona fides who are making these decisions that um, they're making them uh, out of s some sense of what they think is right for whatever the issue is. Hmm. It's a weird. It's a weird time. I mean, it's a weird time to be on TV. It's a weird time to have a column. It's a weird time to do any of this stuff because I think that the one thing that I'm surprised by is is how quickly people are to the gotcha kind of mentality of. Well, there are things that are unknown in people's lives, and there are things that uh, um, you're just unaware of to make judgments about people. I think it's very hard to make judgments because you find things out. Uh, uh, you know, there's people, or two people that I know uh, that I have a very good friend who is uh, named Michael Sheehan, who is a, uh, a speech, he runs a speech consultant business in Washington, and he's also uh, one of the poobahs that runs the uh, 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 <coughs> speech impediment uh, stutterers, National Stutter Society, and he books, they have a they have an award show every year, and, right. you know, he's calling me up because Samuel L. Jackson had done three of the things. I, I had no idea Samuel L. Jackson had a stuttering problem as a child. Really? Yeah. And then, uh, and then um, they got a substitute host. He would have been, like, in a fantasy draft. He would have been one of my last choices. <laughs> well, here's the, the other thing is, I worked alongside this guy. As a matter of fact, I helped hire him at ESPN. The substitute host was Josh Elliott. And, and he, he also has speech? Yeah. Really? I had no comprehension. I mean, the this. most famous one was Bill Walton, who like yeah. who couldn't say really anything when he was, you know, at UCLA, and if he got nervous, that was yeah. it. And now he became an announcer. I tell you, but, it would be very interesting because of the number of the variety of guests you have. Michael would be—he's coming out for the ESPYS. I'll introduce you to him. He, mm. He's a, be an interesting guest to talk about the uh, people and finding this out about them, and in a position like he, that he has. Yeah. Um, anything else we need to cover? I think we've covered more than I imagined we'd cover it all. <laughs> I think we've covered it up until, you know, the, uh, when um, is my, uh, uh, retirement uh, podcast. <laughs> no, when is, well, now that's until 2014. When is your, um, when's your Grantland Network podcast going to start? There's <laughs> oh, been rumors. Oh, that's, yeah, that's, well, that's, that's up to you. I already, I already greenlit it. I'm you're, the you're, boss. Okay. You're, you're the boss. So let's just get the logistics going. I'm ready. Do you know what it's going to be called? Uh, I, I'll have to think of an inventive name. It won't be Grant. It won't be Rice. 
because you spend more more time uh, conceiving your fantasy team names than probably anybody ever. You have a theory of fantasy team names that the owner's name has to be in the name. Well, or some characteristic about the owner, or some you know, uh, I every fantasy team, the original fantasy league. Uh, that was started the Rotisserie League. It was the Okie Finokies were Dan Okrent. Everybody, the Glen Wagoners were the, uh, the Wagoners. Um, everybody connected their name. Uh, uh, Rob Flater's team was the Flater Mice. Yeah. Everybody, so I, I remain true to that, and I try to do my best. And I think at ESPN, I'm partners with Marie Donahue. And uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm an albino and I look like Santa Claus. So uh, our team name is the Donna Ho Ho Ho's. And our other team name is the Santa Marie's. Right. So um, those are two of the more inventive names that we've come up with over the years. But I believe you have to make it a part of your personality. These people that call ourselves the David Stearns or people that, you know, that just invent something. I have no time for that. So... Like the BS report is a name you'd approve because BS yes, is my initials. Absolutely. And so matter of need- fact, ingenious. All right. So we need to come up with something. Yeah. We wanted to have you every month or so. You talk to somebody who's interesting. Okay. We'll tape it and we'll put it on the Grantland Network. I'm ready to go. I think this could be a new career for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do enjoy our conversation. All right. On the air or off the air. All right. Congrats on your 20th SBC. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Talk to you soon. Target the sound off. Whoa. Thank you for downloading the BS Report with Bill Simmons. Too much fun. Check out more podcasts at the iTunes Music Store or at PodCenter at ESPNRadio.com. Peace out.